Yeah, it's important. Handy things for the geologists, though, because we can actually work out how long features have been on the surface. We can actually yes. date yes, rocks but, and yes. how long they've been there. One thing about Beagle 2, it can't actually move. Well, don't let's forget the two American ro robots, Spirit and Opportunity, and they'll land there in January and roam around. How do they compare with Beagle 2? Well, I, I'd actually dispute that Beagle can't move. It does have the mole, which, uh, yes, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> Whenever anybody wants to move, yes. as soon as they move 10 metres, somebody wants yes. to move 11. Okay. And uh, Spirit and Opportunity are going to move farther than Beagle too. But what we've tried to do on Beagle is emphasize, put the emphasis on the science and not worry about having to move, get our data from as near as we can. Mm. The two rovers, however, are going to act as uh, field geologists. They're, their design is to move around the surface they have a device on them that can actually look at a rock in the distance and say, is it worth going to this rock? It's got an infrared spectrometer. Is this a rock we want to study? If it is, they move over, they do geochemistry and they do mineralogy. Uh, their function is leading up to the possibility of one day we will want to bring back samples of rocks. And they believe that by going to places that, uh, that they've selected, that they'll find diverse suites of rocks and they will find material which has been deposited as sedimentary material. And then they will have a better idea of, the, of what they need to be planning for a future sample return. But that future sample return, in my view, within NASA, is too far away. One day, we will go to Mars, but artists have been there before us. And there were all kinds of ideas for Martian bases. And earlier on, I spoke to our leading astronomical artist, David Hardy. Mars has been the most interesting planet, I suppose, for as far as artists are concerned, for many, many years. Um, and certainly in the, in the 50 years, almost 50 years that we've worked together, it, our ideas on Mars have had to change dramatic, dramatically several times. They have. And this is a painting, one of my very first ones that I did for a, when we were, we were talking about doing a book called Challenge of the Stars together. I in, remember we did it too. In 1954. And that again shows Mars um, with, with the blue sky and with vegetation, strips of vegetation, which were what we called canals. That was the best available evidence at the time. It turned out yeah. to be wrong, but it wasn't our fault. Now, the, um, the most prolific artist in the 1950s was, of course, Chesley Bonnestell, yeah. who worked uh, with uh, the, the German rocket designer, Werner von Braun. This is a Bonnestell painting of Mars, beautiful painting again, with, uh, with traces of canals, uh, the southern polar cap. Ludek Peszek was really famous for painting uh, dust storms on Mars. He was a Czechoslovakian artist who uh, moved to Switzerland and lived there for a number of years and also did a lot of work for the uh, National Geographic magazine working in America in the 1970s. And I met him once for us, nice job. That's one of my early pictures I did with, uh, yes. for the, for, in fact, for the book called Challenge of the Stars, which we did together in 1972. It's a long ago, is that? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, and that, of course, shows Mars. By that time, we, we knew that how thin the atmosphere was and therefore the sky there is shown as a very, very dark blue but the sun is glow glowing there in the, in the dark sky. And uh, you can see there are craters and, um, again, of course, deserts. This is a painting by a British artist called Richard Bisley, and it shows some of the uh, very dramatic canyons on Mars. And Richard has shown the, um, the canyon as having early morning fog in it, because this is what happens, isn't it, when the, when the carbon dioxide uh, sort of ice and snow that has deposited during the Martian night uh, sublimes as the morning sun hits it it forms this, these clouds of, uh, of, of mist. But it would be nice to think that these, uh, these canyons correspond to the Rolls Canals, but of course they don't. They don't, unfortunately, Let's no. check that out. No. Now, by the time we did the um, updated version of Challenge of the Stars, which we rather imaginatively called the New Challenge of the Stars in 1978, Viking had landed on Mars and sent back pictures, and we knew then that uh, the sky isn't, in fact, blue at all or, or dark dark blue or black, it was a sort of pinky-orange colour. which comes there's so much, so much dust in the molten yes. atmosphere. Yes, it's, uh, the atmosphere actually, be, although it's very thin, it's a lot of su suspended dust hangs about. Here we've got a, a, a painting by, um, for the first time, in fact, a female artist, uh, Lynn Perkins, who's also American, and she's shown the fact that you do get, after the Martian night, you get frost on Mars, you get quite large areas where there's, um, and Viking also saw this, didn't it, at times, during the Martian winter, where there are patches of, uh, of frost on the ground. This one's called um, Martian Odyssey. It's, it's by another American artist called uh, Frank Hettig. And uh, he works using some in 
on the computer, but using some interesting techniques in, involving uh, painting and also his, his own photographs that he takes and then superimposes them into, onto the pictures. And finally, looking far into the future, uh, this is a painting I did um, of Mars has been terraformed. Now, some people like Carl Sagan and Arthur C. Clarke have suggested this, and they've, they've also written in, in books about the terraforming of Mars, converting it into an Earth-like world. I wonder, David, how far ahead they're going to be, do you think? I think we're looking uh, a couple of hundred years ahead, probably, but... Uh, I would have thought more than that. I may be wrong. Yeah. I mean, it'll take a long time just simply to release the gases anyway. It'll, it could take hundreds of years even to do that. Well, we won't see it, but I think that people who live there will look back at your painting for the 21st century and say, well, you were right most of the time. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As you know, we held a competition and asked viewers to send in drawings of Mars bases. We had a very good response. We selected ten finalists and then asked you, the viewers, to choose the winner. And you've done that. And the winner is M. Ward, runner-up Dan Bright. And we're sending prizes out to all our ten finalists. The the novel I've written recently called Voyage to Mars, my impression of the first journey to the Red Planet. So congratulations to you all. We are now pretty confident that there was once liquid water on the far surface of Mars. There isn't any now. All right, what's happened to it? It's gone. How? <laughs> we aren't sure whether it all went suddenly or whether it went slowly, gradually seeping away. It's tied up, the water on the surface of Mars is tied up with the atmosphere and the thickness of Mars's atmosphere. Mars only has a thin atmosphere now. We believe it had a thicker atmosphere in the past. Mars isn't big enough to have clung on to its atmosphere. So once the atmosphere had gone, there'd be no more liquid water on the surface of Mars. And the, and the water may not have been everywhere. It could have been in certain locations. And it, and it, and it got churned up with the dust and transported around and deposited out in other places. And, but I think the important thing, it didn't sort of suddenly vaporise overnight. It would have disappeared gradually, but it wouldn't have been in every place on Mars at any one time. But after all, I wonder whether the climate changes over long periods. After we know that our axis is fairly steady at 20.5 degrees. Mars, because you have a moon, Mars is not, it varies. And also the eccentricity of the Martian orbit varies. Can there be wild climatic changes, and could the water ever come back? Well, the same wobble that Mars has occurs to the Earth. It's the Milankovitch theory for the Earth, which cause, causes climatic variation. Mar Mars has it on a much more ex eccentric That's scale, and really. that will certainly change the, the heating at higher latitudes when it goes to the most, most tilted state. So, yes, that will have an effect upon the changing climate of Mars, but the key thing, as Monica has said, it is a small planet. It can't sustain a large atmosphere. And any atmosphere as it builds up will fly off. It has a very an escape velocity that allows the atmosphere to disappear. Well, actually, the, the, those are models and speculation. And Beagle will actually, for the first time, study water in situ on Mars. One of the reasons why you, we want to go under the boulder is that this is a place of uh, where you might find a, a coal trap where something mm. could be tracked mm. down. Mm. If we could get our hands on a, a fraction of a percent of water out of the soil, and measure the isotopic composition in situ, then we can tell you something about the mechanism by which water was in fact left, was going away from the planet. Also, we have the, the cameras on board that are going to study the dissociation effect in, in the atmosphere, and we're going to collaborate with the ion experiments, experiments in orbit. So we will be telling you an awful lot about these mechanisms that uh, will become, uh, we will have data for as opposed to just models. But we know now the Martian polar caps really are made up of water ice. There must be a permafrost for under the surface. Can there be well, underground seas, if you like? I think underground seas are not so likely. Um, permafrost, certainly, and there's certainly water uh, trapped in the mineral grains and as an integral part of the, the mineral grains uh, below the surface. Uh, we know that there have been channels formed and some of the thoughts are that those channels have been formed by slumping and that water ice below the ground has melted and and caused this slumping and, and re release of volatiles. So it, it's there's certainly um, water trapped as ice below the ground but probably not as seas. 
And you say the, the poles are, are water ice. Actually, the very coldest pole could actually be carbon dioxide mm. ice mixed as well. Mm. Oh, yeah. so, could, so the atmosphere almost could actually be raining out on itself as, 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 it, as the material gets circulated around. So the polar regions are incredibly complicated and require an awful lot of further examination. In fact, there is a group of geologists in the States who are going off to look at areas around northern Norway, which they think have some similarities with the features they've seen actually on Mars. Of course, the real answer is to go to a world and look at it. We've been to the moon. The last man to go there was Eugene Cernan, who left in 1972. But what about Mars? That is far more difficult. Remember, Mars is always billions of miles away and good around the sun, not around the Earth. So can we go there? And can we possibly change it or terraform it, make it more like the Earth, where we can live in the open? Well, that lies a long, long way ahead. But um, who better to answer that than Arthur C. Clarke, the great visionary? So, Arthur, what do you think about it? I'm sure you remember the days when any thoughts, any talk of space travel, going to the moon, what nonsense. Uh, there was a famous scientist back in the last century who proved uh, it was nonsense for a simple argument. Uh, it takes so many, uh, so many, uh, so much energy to carry, say, one pound of explosive away from the Earth. No explosive contains enough energy. To, it would take the energy of 10 pounds of explosive to take one pound away from the Earth. So therefore, it was impossible. Why it never occurred to him that, OK, use 10 pounds of explosive to send one pound away from the Earth, the explosives that do the job and stay right here on Earth. That's the sort of argument we had to put up with. Uh, and then it came, uh, even more ridiculous, of course, for the people who said that, well, surely you know that space is a vacuum. There's nothing there for a rocket to push against. When and how will we have manned, sorry, personed space flight to Mars? Well, <clears throat> certainly not for 10 years. I doubt if in 20. However, if there was some urgent reason, if, for instance, we found there was a cure for AIDS on Mars, we could be there within five years, but I think more likely to be 25. Terraforming Mars, what would it look like? Well, terraforming means changing a planet so it resembles Earth. And a lot of people think this is a bad idea. You know, we should leave the planets as they are, not mess around with them. Well, we have terraformed one planet already, the planet Earth. Uh, wouldn't be so many people living on it now if we hadn't developed agriculture and irrigation, all sorts of techniques which have enabled us to change our, much of our planet to a more habitable place. So um, I suspect we will terraform Mars or certainly large areas of it. All right, there's, um, Mars now is not like the Earth in many ways. Can we do anything about it? This uh, terraforming, changing Mars, any of you have different views on this? Um, What's your view on that, Monica? Can we ever terraform Mars? My view is I don't think we ought to terraform Mars. I don't think we've got the right to change a planet. Why make it like the Earth? To make it like the Earth, we need to, to build up an atmosphere and to keep the atmosphere. Mars is very small. It's already lost at least one atmosphere. It can't cling on to its atmosphere because it's just not gravitationally stable enough. So we would have to work terribly hard terribly, terribly hard to make an atmosphere that Mars would keep, and I don't think it's ethically right. Certainly, there's, um, if there were any advanced right there, I quite agree, but um, there aren't any Martians. Well, only Martians, but it's to add to the point that the moniker is right, terraforming, actually, I don't think will work. I really think it's, it, it's a mistake, because you can it, it change the environment in one location, and we could do it in any part of, of, of our own planet, but as soon as you do that, you change the mass of the atmosphere, you change the pressure, you change the temperature, you change the winds, you change the weather systems, mm -hmm. and you redistribute that atmosphere. And it's not a question of what we change in an instant in time. Can we sustain what we establish? I, the, and I the, think there's a lot of question marks there. The thing about our cycle on Earth is plate tectonics is so very, very important yes. for the stability of the atmosphere as well, for the recycling of carbon through the atmosphere, through the rocks, through the hydrosphere. Mars doesn't have that balance. It hasn't got the active volcanism yeah. putting gases back. So the, the whole idea of having a, a, an atmosphere and its interaction with the rocks, there is none of that cycling there that we have on the Earth. So it would be terribly difficult to 
to terraform? Certainly we close to many centuries we do it at all. Mm. I don't think we could even try. No. <laughs> I, I, think think it's, I think it would be an environmental disaster it, yeah. if we even... Yeah. You know, we are going out of our way not to take microbes Indeed, to Mars. Yes. And I don't think anybody should be planning to make changes. To I think we're planet. doing a good enough job to, to actually pollute our own planet without, 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 without trying to be honest. All well. right, then, well, let's look forward. <laughs> so we seem to be unanimous, yes, actually, Patrick. <laughs> You're not getting very far on this one. <laughs> let's look forward, then, to the next uh, few tens of years. Uh, what do you imagine is going to happen with Martian research between now and 2050? What's your view on this? I think uh, the next stage clearly ought to be to uh, let's get through. The, the assessment is to whether or not uh, Mars does have uh, any smidgen of an, bit of evidence about life. I think that's what Beagle may do. We may need another tier of missions to mm. follow that up. Mm. But the next fundamental step is bringing back samples. Absolutely. Sample There's, return has got to be the way to go forward. When Coy and I were working together, what, 25, 30 years ago, dare yeah. we say? That was the thing we wanted to do. Yes, We've indeed. gone from flybys to orbiters to landers. We're talking about balloons, even you know, gliders. Sample return has got to be our goal and not just for one place. So the mm. ability to move over the surface of Mars and return well, material. Well, I disagree with you there because these days, somebody with the techniques that Monica and I have, a right. 50 micron sized particle is a rock. And there would be two times 10 to the eight particles in 200 grams of soil, which because Mars is a mobile planet, right. the geologists and the geochemists could sort that material over mm. and they could tell you a fantastic amount about Mars from one 200 gram sample yeah. taken from Wouldn't one site. Wouldn't you love to have a genuine Martian rock in the laboratory? I have genuine Martian rocks yeah. in, the, in terms of the meteorites, but to bring back I mean, one something, brought back, brought one brought back, back would be, would be marvellous. It doesn't have to be a solid rock though, as Colin says. The, the Martian dust, the soil, would teach us as much as we need to, to know in the first instance about Mars. Think how much we learnt about the moon from the, the first Indeed. lunar samples. And really, to bring some soil back from Mars would be marvellous. I think also to take this one stage further, because one of the challenges geologists have is that a geologist uh, looking at the Earth is happiest when he's got a rock in their hand and a hammer and they can do the analysis. So if we can actually learn how we can take observations in space and calibrate them by from the rocks we have on the ground. That is a very important mm -hmm. step forward. And if Mars can actually help in that equation, it actually shows benefit not just for Mars exploration in its own right, but actually geological exploration in the broadest sense. We well, actually come back to that. It's a very, very, very sound point. Right. Because Mars Express is actually going to map the whole planet, we have plans in train be for collaborations between the orbiter instruments and Beagle so that when we calibrate something on the ground, mm. the people in orbit are going to use that information to become global with it. Well, lastly, we had a competition for designs of Martian bases. We showed that earlier on. Do you think we are ever going to have Martian bases? And if so, when? Any ideas? I'm sure we will. It's a question of when, not if. Uh, I wouldn't want to put a date on it, but mm. uh, the date always seems to be... Uh, too soon whenever it's in the eyes of the public and uh, too far when it's in the eyes of the politicians. I think so I, let's try and come back somewhere in the middle. I think <laughs> Arthur Clarke is being optimistic to say it's 20 odd years away mm. because you, we've actually got to get, get someone there. And if we, if we think about Apollo 13, one of the quite. joys of Apollo 13 was we're able to get the people back. Mm. Now, if we send a mission to Mars, can we actually get the, uh, the, the, the astronauts back no. for that mission? The answer is no. Mm. And I think until we can actually solve the propulsion problems and the ability for, for quick transit, because it's a long journey, that's really going to limit mm. where it's going to be. Bear in mind, Arthur was right about landing on the moon. The rest of us are wrong, and he got it right. Perhaps we should place bets with Arthur. That should be part of it. So, Gary, Colin... Monica, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Patrick. Well, you've seen a lot. you see a lot more. We won't go to Mars, but people will, and possibly in the foreseeable future. I just wonder. I'm prepared to believe the first man or woman on Mars may be alive now and may well be watching this program. I wonder. So I will say this. If the first man on Mars is watching now, and you go to Mars, and I'm still around, do cast your mind back, and do please send me an email. So, the year of Mars. Don't forget our website, www.b.
bbc.co.uk slash space. And when I come back next month, we'll be looking much further out and talking about distant galaxies. So until then, good night. Thank you.